Wayland Yutani Corporation has continued to serve as the overarching and omnipresent evil entity that looms large like dark clouds over everything bad that happens in the alien movies, games, novels, and, by and large, the entire extended universe of the franchise. It's often been portrayed as a mega corporation that exhibits all the worst possible aspects of a corporation that focuses on profits above everything else. The corporation willingly sacrifices its employees, let alone the decency to protect them, in its relentless struggle for money and power, so essentially, Wayland yutani serves as a contemporary portrayal of the long-established science fiction archetype of a malevolent megacorporation. In this video, we will explore Wayland yutani and try to conclude if it is as bad as people think it is, or if it has done some good deeds as well. Let's begin, shall we? Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. The Founding of the Wayland yutani Corporation In almost all the portrayals, Wayland yutani has been depicted as having something to do with all aspects of space research and colonization. The company has been consistently pressuring its employees and agents to capture live specimens of the designated species known as Xenomorph XX121 without regard for the safety of those involved for the purpose of exploiting their biology as weapons. Having said that, according to Carl Bishop Wayland, the company's main objective in acquiring and weaponizing the Xenomorphs is to maintain humanity's supremacy in the universe rather than solely for profit. But how exactly did Wayland Yutani come into existence? Wayland Yutani Corporation was formed by the amalgamation of the British mega firm Wayland Corp and the Japanese Yutani Corporation. While not much is known about Yutani Corporation except that the firm used predator technology to rise up the ranks, Wayland Corp was started by Peter Wayland. His mother was a professor of comparative mythology with an Oxford education, and his father was a self taught engineer was born in Mumbai, India on October 1st, 1990. At the age of 14, he invented a synthetic trachea made of engineered stem cells, which earned him his 12th patent. On October 11th, 2012, Peter Wayland established Wayland Corp, which he named after himself. On March 27th, 2015, Wayland hid his first billion because he looked up some solar panels that move just like the Earth does, so they always soak up the sun's rays, like it's summertime. And the best part? They keep on doing it all year long. This this effectively ended global warming. This was the first major milestone in the life of Peter Wayland and in the future of his marvelous firm. But things changed for Wayland Corp after the death of its founding father and by 2099, Yutani Corporation had taken over its British counterpart, thus forming an ultra-rich and powerful mega corporation called Wayland yutani Corporation. Interestingly, the corporation in the movie Alien had a different name at first, Wayland yutani to be exact. You could spot it for a quick sec on a monitor, a can, etc. The logo for the company in the movie was like a sun with wings, taking cues from Egyptian-style buildings. However, it was James Cameron who added the D in Wayland. Wayland yutani storyline in an alien universe You know, Wayland Industries achieved something or the other each year from its inception until 2099, when it merged with Utani Corporation. So to keep the video informative and crisp, we will only discuss the major turning points in the history of the firm. If we are to follow the timeline, on December 10th, 2017, Wayland was awarded the Nobel Prize in Science for his badass work on the polar ice caps. He used the big bucks he made in 2015 to buy the rights to some dope technology that NASA came up with but couldn't fund properly. They called it Project Prometheus, or something fancy like that. That's not all. In 2023, the year we are presently living in, Wayland found the cure for almost all forms of cancer, and if we are to believe the alien universe, Wayland will introduce us to David in 2025, his first ever synthetic prototype. However, David would invite a lawsuit from Yutani Corporation over itself, but Wayland Corp would go on to win the lawsuit and patents to David 3-4 years later. And then on, there was no stopping Wayland Corp. These guys filed for innumerable patents and achieved technological and biological feats such as discovering the body's ability to go into hypersleep, the science behind faster-than-light travels, etc. In 2028, Wayland Industries made major changes to their David Android prototype, which allowed him to interact with humans for the first time. This meeting went really well, and just a few months later, in March of that same year, the company achieved something pretty darn impressive. They hit a market capitalization of $100 billion in just five years. 
years, making them the first company ever to do so. On July 27, 2030, Wayland Industries scored a patent for an awesome invention, the hypersleep chamber. This device could start up, keep tabs on, and end hypersleep, which was a huge game changer for space travel. Thanks to it, missions could go on for way longer and be way more intense than ever before, which meant humans could make discoveries no one thought possible. So you see, each of these milestones is essentially paving the way for Wayland to do what he ultimately does. In May of 2032, Wayland's Brainiacs cracked a mind-blowing discovery. They found the inverse relationship between velocity and the flow of time, and with that knowledge, they were able to create something that people had been dreaming of for ages, faster than light travel. Once they had that breakthrough, they started figuring out how to make it work for real-world applications, which is probably how the spaceships in the alien universe, like the Nostromo and Sulaco, were able to get around. Oh, by the way, you should keep in mind that through all these years, the weapons wing of the firm was hard at improving rifles, and they eventually invented the Pulse Rifle. By the year 2033, Wayland Corp had 1 million employees, and each year, they discover something more extraordinary and profitable than any previous discovery. On December 21st, 2037, Wayland Stargazers spotted a part of space that was chock full of minerals and all sorts of other goodies, which they called the Outer Veil. The company was pretty stoked about it, and even made plans to visit this area within the next hundred years. In the year 2039, they created the first breathable atmosphere on planet GJ667CC using their terraforming tech, and later in that year, they discovered Acheron LV426, the very planet that started it all. The next few decades were equally monumental for the industry. Patents like power loaders, intergalactic lifeboats, advanced vehicles for extraterrestrial travel, etc., came in handy until Holloway discovered the star map. However, by that time, they had made exceptional upgrades to David, so much so that people could not tell if David was a human or a robot with the capability ability of copying human emotions and nuances. But then, in 2073, Peter Wayland opened the long-awaited project Prometheus, and that was that. It ended in his doom, which facilitated the takeover of Wayland Corp by Utani Corporation in 2099. After this, it served majorly as a supplier of advanced computers, starships, synthetics, etc. Furthermore, by 2150, the evil organization owned practically everything and had its hands on everything from intergalactic shipping and transport to biomedical mechanical research and weapons technology. But the firm was not just a manufacturer, they were big time players in shipping and transportation to other planets, and even had human colonies set up outside of our solar system, all run by their extrasolar colonization administration. Plus, they had a say in all the action as a member of the review board for the Interstellar Commerce Commission, which they basically owned, even though it was supposed to be independent or whatever. Why does Wayland yutani want a live xenomorph? We cannot stress enough the fact that the xenomorphs aren't as much the monsters in the alien films as are the men and women who make decisions for Wayland yutani Corporation. Their efforts to acquire a xenomorph are so ruthless that they consider their employees expendable. Imagine if your employer wanted you dead if it meant that a certain project would get completed in time. Scary, right? But why does Wayland yutani want a xenomorph so badly? What would they do with it? Well, if you have watched the movies, you may have some idea, and if you've read the novels or the comics, you may know some more. But let's explore all the things that the Mega Corporation wants with these minions of hell. Introduced in Ridley Scott's Alien, they never actually say Wayland yutanis name out loud, and prefer calling it The Company. They just show it on computer screens and beer cans and stuff. It's like this mysterious presence lurking in the background. In the movie, the commercial space vessel Nostromo is on its way back to Earth with a team of seven crew members in stasis, including Ellen Ripley. They're all snoozing away in stasis when the ship's computer, Mother, picks up a distress signal coming from a nearby moon. Mother wakes up the crew in accordance with company policy, which requires the investigation of any potential distress signals. The moon's atmosphere messes up their ship, so the engineers stay behind to fix it while the others go check out the signal. Soon, Ripley learns that the signal was in fact a warning. Ripley also learns about the company's intention of bringing back a xenomorph specimen safely back to Earth, regardless of the cost. In James Cameron's Aliens, this role was taken over by Eleven's favorite doctor, Carter Burke. Wait, that's from another universe. Oh, come on, we all like a Stranger Things reference here and there. At least we do. Anyway, in Aliens, the Colonial Marines find it more than difficult to deal with the biomechanical threat, and it proves just how skilled the Xenomorphs were at killing and slaughtering. Xenomorphs are insanely powerful and destructive, which means they're perfect for use as a bioweapon. And get this, 
Wayland yutani actually wants to mass-produce these things. It's pretty messed up if you ask us. Let's be real, if you had an army of these living weapons that could outbreed any resistance and wipe out entire populations in no time, you'd be unstoppable. And that's exactly what Wayland yutani wants to go for. Obtaining a viable specimen of the Xenomorphs was one of their main objectives. Whether it was a facehugger, chestburster, or adult, they believed that self-replicating weapons like the Xenomorph could be a crucial component for distant force projection operations. However, they preferred immature chestbursters inside people because they offered easier access through checkpoints. Traditional security measures and ammunition stores were susceptible to unforeseen threats that could easily deplete resources across vast distances in space. In some instances, they preferred immature chestburster samples due to their ease of passing through quarantine undetected within their hosts. But apart from using the Xenomorphs as bioweapons, which is the central interest of Wayland yutani the company wants something more from the most potent killing machine in the universe. Wayland yutani is heavily invested in scientific research, right? So it is very natural that capturing live Xenomorphs could provide ample opportunities for experimentation and development. The unique traits of the Xenomorphs could be utilized in creating new innovations. Just as shark teeth and stingray tails were used in crafting early weapons and genetically engineered spider and silkworm, silk is used to produce body armor, the Xenomorphs could have a wide range of applications in the production of both military and civilian products. We have explored more than a few comics in which scientists from Wayland yutani have not just tried to use Xenomorphs as weapons, but they have been conducted several experiments to pet the Xenomorphs. As crazy as that sounds, they did really try all that. Wayland yutanis Major Business Ventures So we already know how the bioweapons division of the Wayland yutani Corporation functioned. Let's quickly explore the other major divisions of the Unethical Goliath. After the bioweapons division, the most important one has to be the Reverse Engineering Division, whose primary objective was reverse engineering the Yocha technology so that it could be used by humans. This department came into being probably because of the efforts of Mr. Wayland, who is believed to have taken over Borgia Industries. So for those of you who do not know, Borgia Industries was led by Hunter Borgia, a human who would have died at a young age if it had not been for the green life-giving predator blood that saved Hunter as an infant. After growing up, Hunter Borgia wanted to transform himself into a human predator. Furthermore, he had predator technology at his disposal, which was left behind by the same predator named Scarface. Hunter Borgia met a horrific end, but you can check out our video on his origin and what makes him a force to reckon with. So quite evidently, Wayland Corp used everything that Borgia Industries once owned to replicate Yocha technology. Furthermore, in the 2007 movie, Aliens vs. Predator Requiem, a Miss Yutani arrives to collect from one Colonel Stevens. This further proves the influence Yutani Corporation has on Wayland Yutani's reverse engineering division. Needless to say, even this division has little to no regard for morals and ethics. Furthermore, there are other divisions like the Special Services Division that care for extra scientific projects. For instance, Carter Burke from Aliens served as the Special Projects Director, but it could be an umbrella organization that essentially takes care of all other divisions and serves as an oversight committee. Of course, there's the Weapons Division, which takes care of conducting research and development of weapons, which can range from anything from a pulse rifle to a power loader, but that's not it. In 2065, Wayland Industries was approached by the U.S. government to establish a peacekeeping force composed of Marines for future colonial conflicts. This initiative eventually gave rise to the Colonial Marines. Clearly, the U.S. Colonial Marine Corps has a close relationship with Wayland yutani In fact, Wayland yutani also manufactured many of the Corps' weapons and vehicles and often oversaw their deployment in operations where the company had a significant stake. Although the company didn't officially own the Corps, they partially financed it, effectively making the Corps available for their personal use and even using USCM equipment themselves. Competitors of Wayland yutani Corporation Of course, in a world so huge and with technology so advanced, there could hardly be one mega corporation without any competition. The first one of these, and possibly the most haywire one, is Sinsound, a firm that wanted to fill the airwaves with all kinds of experimental music. They even used the voices of dead musicians like Elvis. They were always trying to one-up their rivals over at MedTech. Sinsound helped this guy, Damon Eddington, get his hands on an ovomorph from MedTech, and he recorded all kinds of 
kinds of crazy sounds from the alien, like it killing animals and people, etc. Eddington wanted to release a symphony of hate using these sounds, but things went wrong when the xenomorph broke loose. It was a total mess. Speaking of medtech, the synth sound rival, this company's field of expertise was primarily medical research. And of course, they were so caught up with it that they forgot if they should carry out such experiments on xenomorphs. They even had this top secret lab with a xenomorph hive under their main office. They first captured a xenomorph that they called Old Blue before using it as a tracker for other xenomorphs. Eventually, they even created a xenomorph-based robot. These two firms appeared in the comics titled Aliens, Music of the Spears, and continued to remain one of the most obnoxious yet entertaining of all alien story arcs. The next in line has to be the Chigusa Corporation, which employed the legendary human predator Machiko Noguchi. She is from the ultra-rare breed of humans who were inducted into a Yaucha clan. The Chigusa Corporation was headed by Takashi Chigusa and had its headquarters situated in New Osaka. The primary focus of the company was to construct and manage colonies beyond the boundaries of our solar system. Regrettably, the selection of planets for colonization made by the company turned out to be ill-fated, with two of the colonies being struck by catastrophic events. Ryushi, which was previously utilized as a training ground for young predators, was chosen as a site, and it turned out to be disastrous when a group of predators arrived there to perform a blooding ritual. You should definitely check out our video on the life and history of Miss Noguchi. Another one from the comics, Montcalm Delacroix at Sea, was a company run by Lucien Delacroix and his partner, but in reality, it was controlled by a computer mainframe named Toy, which wanted to exterminate humans by creating a species of hybrid xenomorphs by splicing the DNA of humans, predators, and aliens. Speaking of gene splicing and hybrids, we've already spoken about Borgia Industries. Borgia Industries was owned by the notorious Borgia family, with links to organized crime. Following the destruction of New Way City by the self-destruct device of Scarface, the company took the opportunity to rebuild the city and rename it Neonopolis. Eventually, the company was acquired by Mr. Wayland, who utilized some of Borgia Borgia's technology to develop the mother computer. Then, there's the ZCT Corporation from Aliens, Rogue, which owned the Sharon base. This place housed Project Chimera under the supervision of Ernst Kleist. Despite being in charge, Kleist was dissatisfied with the restrictions imposed by the Mega Corporation and attempted to gain more autonomy. He concealed several breakthroughs, such as his early achievement of creating the Xenomorph King via gene splicing. Unfortunately, Project Chimera met its demise when the Sharon base exploded causing significant losses to the company's assets. Lastly, we have the Grant Corporation and the Siegson. In Aliens Genocide, the Grant Corporation experienced a rapid rise after Earth was cleared of aliens, profiting from xenomorph research and developing various products. However, after encountering financial and legal problems, Daniel Grant led a mission to Xenomorph Prime to obtain more royal jelly, resulting in a change of heart and an effort to reform the company. In contrast, the Siegson Corporation is a major player in the new alien expanded universe, responsible for producing mal functioning working Joe androids without behavioral inhibitors. Siegson's downfall culminated in the destruction of the Sevastopol station in 2137 by Amanda Ripley in Alien Isolation. Will we see Wayland yutani Corporation in upcoming Alien TV shows? Well, yes, we would be seeing the company on the new Alien TV show, but the Megalomania Mega Corporation would have a rather subdued role. Instead of being the overarching secondary villain, Wayland yutani would have competition in the form of several similar firms. We feel that this is nothing short of a welcome move, and although the first two films were great, great is an understatement. They were legendary. Anyway, what we're trying to say is that although the Wayland yutani Corporation's major role in the first two movies was just about perfect, it would not harm to see a few more players fighting for economic and military dominance. The more unethical goliaths there are, the more xenomorphs running around the place. But this is one man's opinion. What do you think? And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks everyone.